Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In letter 63, Seneca is seemingly consoling his friend Lucilius on a common event back in Roman times and also unfortunately and inevitably in our own, the loss of a friend through death, which is bound to happen to all of us unless we're extraordinarily lucky and we die before all of our friends. But he's not just consoling him, He's actually providing him with some very useful and I think well-grounded, realistic advice. So he begins by saying that, you know, I am sorry your friend has passed away. I want you not to grieve excessively. And so we should talk about this term grieving, which is a perfectly fine translation of dolore, which is a broader sense of feeling pain. So grief is a kind of pain that we feel when we have suffered a loss, particularly a loss of somebody to whom we are attached, who we feel is part of our life. And notice the key term here. Seneca is not saying, I'm not going to tell you to grieve at all. As a matter of fact, he'll even bring up towards the end of the letter his own example of grieving for his beloved Aeneas Serenus. And he actually says, I, I did that excessively myself, so I understand this. He says, I don't want you to, to grieve plus aequo, more than is the right amount, more than it is, you know, proportionate, right? And he tells us something really quite extraordinary here. So Seneca is a Stoic. He's definitely a member of the Stoic school. And a lot of people think that Stoicism means you don't show any emotion. Ideally, you know, you stuff them down deep inside or even better, you don't feel them at all. Don't get attached to people. That is not genuine Stoicism. And Seneca talks here he may be referencing the legendary sage, the perfect person, the ideal of Stoicism, or he might be just talking about people who are very, very well developed in it. He says, such firmness of mind, so as not to grieve at all, belongs only to the person who has risen high above misfortune. Now, this rising high, this is actually from a Stoic perspective, that uh, I think really a perspective more broadly of ancient philosophy, this is what we call great soldness or magnanimity, which is part of the virtue of courage or fortitude for the Stoics. And it's something that, you know, if you've developed yourself enough, you're able to, you know, rise above. They always use a metaphor of height in this case. Notice what he says about this person they will feel a twinge, right? So, um, they will feel something. They won't be completely sealed off, not feeling anything, totally unaffected. They'll feel a twinge, but it's just a twinge. What about the rest of us? He says, we may be forgiven our tears if there are not too many. So it's a matter not of whether you cry at all, but how much you cry and why you're crying and, and the conditions under that. And he says, if we do regain control, having lost a friend, now notice what he goes on here. He's not just saying, ah, you know, cry if you have to, because you're weak or something like that. Having lost a friend, you should not be dry eyed. 
but neither should you drown in weeping. And he's got this really great phrase here. Um, you should cry, but not wail. So lacrimendum est, right? It is fitting for you to cry, to have lacrime, tears, but don't wail. Don't go overboard. So, you know, think about people at funerals where they lose themselves in grief and they're tearing at their clothes or the, the, the coffin is going into the ground. And instead of just like putting a, a rose on it or a stone or whatever it's going to be, they jump onto the coffin. Okay, that's going way, way too far, right? They're constantly talking about the great loss that they've suffered. And so Seneca says, okay, let's, let's think about this with a lot of people. Now he's not saying this is a completely blanket statement about grief, but for a lot of people, why do they have lamentations? And the English word there is actually just a cognate of lamentaciones in Latin. Well, he says that there's a bit of other centeredness in this. It's not just you feeling your own grief by yourself. You're kind of putting on a show, perhaps for actual others in front of you, perhaps for those who you have internalized. He says, what is the source of weeping beyond measure? We are trying by our tears to prove our sense of loss. It's not that grief forces us, but we are exhibiting grief to others. And this is a great insight. There's a lot of people who, you know, when you say, ah, oh, you know, you don't have to like go overboard with your grief. They're like, well, how can I show how important this person was to me? Well, the person who was important is dead. So they're not looking at you watching being like, okay, that's the right amount of grief. And maybe they're internalized. Seneca is going to talk about memories in a moment as well, but it's more for how I will appear to other people. And this concern that if I don't show excessive grief, then other people will think I didn't love my friend or my spouse or my child or whatever, my, my pet or my coworker or something like that, some other relationship. So there's, you know, is this the case for everybody? Probably not, but Seneca is definitely on to something. And so he says that a lot of people are not just sad for themselves. And he says, even in grief, there is competition, right? So in a way that makes the grief no longer what it is, you're mixing other elements into it. And Seneca suggests, here is where we get away from the don't do this advice, uh, a positive course that you can take in this negative experience. So he says, uh, what then? Should I forget my friend? Well, it's not very long you're promising to remember him if your memory lasts only as long as your grief. So notice, it's possible to have grief, to feel that feeling, and that to be something different from, but connected to your memory of your friend. The grief can go away. The memory doesn't have to. You can retain that your entire life. And he says, the time is at hand when some chance thing will brighten your face with a laugh. Your pangs will subside. Every feeling of loss will be eased. The minute you stop watching yourself, your look of sadness will be gone. So, you know, you don't have to hold on to your grief through this attention. What are we going to do? Let's make the memory of those who are gone a pleasant memory. Remember them in the good parts. Now, this could be difficult. You know, friends we typically want to be with. This could also be applied, say, to family members. Imagine that you have a particularly noxious and cantankerous and critical family member. Is there anything that you can remember about them that isn't all bad that could give you a sense of pleasure? Um, yeah, there might be some mixedness to this. And he says that um, if the thought brings torment, we don't willingly return to it. We feel a biting, a morsus, right? And this is a technical term that the Stoics use for what are sometimes called 
uh, pre-passions or pre-emotions, but it also has this sense of something that is, you know, gripping us and doesn't feel good. But he tells us even this can come to have its own kind of pleasure. And he brings up his friend Antilus, who says, the memory of friends who have died gives a pleasure like that of apples. Now notice the culinary or gustatory uh, metaphors here or reference points, analogies, right? We, we feel um, a, a sense of, like apples that are both tart and sweet or like the pleasing acidity of an old wine. And he says, after time, all that pains us is extinguished. Only the pleasure remains. And then he goes on and says, thinking of friends safe and sound is cakes and honey, just all sweetness. Remembering those who have gone is bittersweet. But who would deny that sharp and even bitter flavors are sometimes to our taste? So there's three different kinds of flavors that are being referenced here. And as a bit of a side note, we are accustomed in the present, in the West, kind of wrongly to think of there being four basic flavors and then maybe there's also umami, sweet, salt, bitter, and sour. So sour and bitter both being referenced here, acidity is sour, but there's also austeris, right? Rough or uh, you know, the sort of uh, feeling that you get from tannin in acorns or wine or things like that. And it's, you know, when mixed together with sweetness, it actually enhances the flavor he is suggesting. And I think this is a very interesting idea here. Um, Seneca says you can have that. So this mix of pleasant and also unpleasant, but in the circumstances also with its own kind of pleasure feeling to it. But also you can have sweet and comforting. Blanda. So blanda is a word that we get bland from. Think of comfort food, the homely, simple stuff that we make for ourselves when we're feeling down, when we want to be cozy. This is the, the effect that those kind of memories of people who we've lost can have for us, according to Seneca. He says, when I had friends, I had them as one who would lose them. Now that I have lost them, I am as one who still has them. How does he still have them within memory? And this is where we also need to bring up something else that Seneca doesn't reference here. We, to some degree, have control over what we do with our faculty of memory. A lot of people don't realize this, perhaps because they are uh, the captives of memories that just flood them or things like that. With attention, with discipline, we can think, we can draw out of memory the things that we want to. So we have a choice about how we create the, the memory image of the friend within us that we linger over. Going on, uh, another important bit of advice, we should appreciate and enjoy the friends while we have them, right? He says that uh, because we cannot be sure how long we will have our friends, let's eagerly enjoy them now. Let's consider how often we've gone on some trip and left them behind, how we failed to see them even while living in the same place. Then we will understand we lost more time with them while they were alive. And he says, some people are careless about their friends while they have them, then grieve terribly for them while they were gone. This is kind of foolishness, right? And this, he references one more time, the excessive grief. Um, they are afraid there may be some doubt whether they really love these people and this makes their grief more effusive. They're looking for delayed signs of their own affection. And this is a sort of showiness, again, to others who are actually seeing us or performatively for the you know, images of those others. What will people say within ourselves? Um, he also has uh, some advice that you might not like to hear, right? You may have gone along with this. He talks about other friends being very useful or helpful when a friend is lost. They can provide you with consolation during the grief. Perhaps they can even grieve with you because they also lost a friend in that. 
And he says, if we have no other friends, we're doing a worse injury to ourselves than fortune has done to us. Fortune took one person from us. We are taking from ourselves every person we don't make our friend. And then he says, anyone who cannot make friends with more than one person does not love that one even very much. So now he's not talking about people who are, say, discriminated against or never given a chance or, you know, become refugees and never have the opportunity to form attachments to many people or any other circumstances like that. He's talking about people who live a, you know, regular life but don't form friendships with more than one person, why aren't they forming friendships with other people? Why are they putting, so to speak, all those eggs in one basket? Is that actually good for the friend? Is, do they want to be you know, isolated in their friendship like that? And he says, this is rather imprudent. If someone lost their only tunic, we were to weep and wail rather than look about for something to put over their shoulders to keep warm, wouldn't you think they were an idiot? The one you've loved has passed away. Find someone to love. Quem ames, right? And this is quoted as sort of a proverb in the text itself in the Latin. Find someone else who you can bestow that love on. Notice that he doesn't say find someone else to love you. Find someone else that you can be loving towards, that you can feel affection towards. And here's where he might seem to be a little bit heartless. He says that um, replacing the friend is better than crying, right? So, uh, you know, you still can cry, but it's better to make some new friends than to simply say, oh, I've, I'll never love anybody again. He also has some really interesting remarks about the factor of time. And here again, Seneca stresses our agency. Time will erode grief, as he's pointed out earlier. And he says that we become tired of grieving, but a thoughtful person should be deeply ashamed to let that be the means of healing Better that you should abandon your grief than it should abandon you. Given that you cannot continue very long, even if you want to, you should stop as soon as you are able. And notice that. He's not saying force yourself to stop. He's saying figure out when you're able to stop grieving and then choose to stop grieving. That is up to you. This emotional state, you don't have to have it be in control of yourself. And he's got some discussion about how long you should grieve. The only thing from that I think is really important is that he says, our forefathers established one year as the period of mourning for women, not that they should mourn that long, but that they should not mourn longer than that. So there's a lot of you know, traditional ideas that people have. Once again, we go to like what you look like in other people's eyes. Oh, if you really love the person, you'll grieve for a whole year. Seneca says, that's nonsense. You can grieve for a day if you want to and then be done with it. If that's really what you're able to do, don't go any longer than that cutoff point, right? Then he uh, talks about his own example. Uh, he says, you know, I've fallen off the path that I'm sketching for you. So what should we do? And here's where it wraps up. Let us remember mortality mortalitas in Latin, the fact that we're going to die because we are human beings. Let us remember mortality in ourselves as well as our loved ones. I should have said about Serenus, he's younger than I am, but what difference does it make? He ought to die after me, but he could die before. Because I did not do this, fortune struck me suddenly and unprepared. Now I keep in mind not only that everyone and everything must die, but that they die according to no determinate law. If it can happen at all, it can happen today. And we can see this as actually, you know, going back to this appreciating and enjoying our friends while we can. We don't know if they're going to be taken away from us tonight, tomorrow, a week from now, a year from now but they will sooner or later either be taken from us or will be taken from them. So keeping in mind mortality, which may seem to some a gloomy thought, can actually enhance our capacity 
to be good friends. So this is a lot of very useful advice with some stoic practices uh, being suggested to his friend Lucilius in a real life situation of facing grief over the loss of a close friend.